Good morning. Welcome to Beach Church. If you're joining us here in person on our Jack's Beach campus, we're so excited to see you. If you're joining us on our online campus, we are so excited to see you as well. Thank you for being here as we gear up for a holiday week. I know many of you probably have plans to go out of town, and, uh, or maybe you're in town. That'd be great too. So thanks for being here this morning as we continue our Bless series. We are in the middle of the series. If you're just joining us, that's okay. There's no quiz. You don't have to know anything. I'll tell you everything you need to know right now, but then you should go back and watch it later. But first week, if you notice, it says begin with prayer. Uh, Bless, the acronym, is about what it means to reach people for Jesus. And the first thing we have to do if we're going to evangelize to the world, we have to pray. We have to pray. We have to spend time with the Lord in order to show people the Lord, right? Second week, we talked about listen. Um, I don't know if you actually listened to this message, but it was super, super convicting. Um, I felt attacked at times, Pastor Jerry, wherever you are. I felt attacked at times because I do this. I'm a terrible, terrible listener at times. And I think the thing for me I was thinking about, you go and you introduce yourself to people and you say, hello, I'm David, nice to meet you. By the way, I'm David, I'm the family pastor here. I don't know if I said that, but nice to meet you all. Uh, You go and you say, hey, my name's David. And they tell you your name and you say, "Uh uh-huh, yep. And then you have a conversation, full conversation and it can go deep. And you get to the end of the conversation and it's like you were trying to remember your name so you didn't listen to theirs. Like we don't know our own names. But I do that all the time. And then it's embarrassing because you now had three full conversations with this person and you still don't know who they are. And what's even worse is then you look and say, hey, what's that person's name? And somebody tells you and you don't listen to them. And so then you have to ask another person because then you're embarrassed to ask this person, which you probably don't know their name too, right? Like it just is this vicious cycle. Or is that, maybe that's just me. I don't know. Um, But it's hard. Being a good listener is hard because every time we listen, we want to think about what we have to say next, especially when there's an argument. We want to listen to people so that we can get our point across versus just listening for listening's sake. So if you want to reach people for Jesus and you want to be a a person that's going out and evangelizing, well, you have to be able to listen. And it was such a convicting message. Please go back and watch those if you haven't. They're incredible. And today, today we're going to talk about eat. Eat, and you may be thinking that that in itself is an acronym. No, it literally means to eat, and I think we know why they picked me this week. Um, <laughs> really excited to talk about eating. I didn't bring any food for you. I thought about putting a bag of cheeses under everybody's seat, but then I was like, it's just gonna make a bunch of noise, and then it's just gonna be a disaster, so I didn't do it. So anyway, uh, eat is what we're gonna talk about today and what it means to eat. Sit at a table with people, fellowship with one another, and how in the world that helps us evangelize. But before we get started, let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you that we have the freedom and the ability to worship you. Thank you for Jesus who came to this earth and showed us what it means to be a perfect human, not so that we have to be perfect, but so that we can seek a closer relationship with you because we live a life like him. Thank you for that example. Thank you for that model. And thank you for the sacrifice. Thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus. Let us never take it for granted. Fill this place with your Holy Spirit. Speak through me today. Speak into people's hearts, open minds, open eyes. Amen. Amen. So we're gonna call, talk about eating. And when I think about eating, I think about this in the way in which the people um, maybe receiving these words, maybe receiving like the early Christians, how they would have received this. And so what I think about is I think about what does culture and what does history tell us in that time period about eating? What did it look like? What did fellowship look like? There's this thing called symposium. And symposium is this Greco-Roman tradition. I was gonna show you a picture. It's a little weird. It's like a bunch of... um, guys just sort of laying around shirtless in robes on couches and like eating stuff. So I didn't bring one of those. I don't know, I thought it might be distracting. But symposium is this thing where people would get together. It was typically people that were of a higher social class, a higher political class. They would get together and they would share a meal. 
And it was typically after victories. So like maybe they go into battle and they have this big victory and they get together and they celebrate and they eat grapes on a couch lounging together. And it was typically two dudes and they're laying beside each other and then people would come and they would serve and there'd be people, there's clearly class structure there. You see that? The people that were being served and the people that were serving, but this is symposium. This is what it means. But it wasn't just for victories. It was also a place where people would get together and they would discuss political matters and things of the day and they would try to focus on what is important in their world so that they, they could be better leaders or they can make more money or whatever the idea was in that moment for that symposium. But that's what symposium was. What's really interesting when we take, think about table fellowship and eating, there are tons of examples in the New Testament where Jesus would sit down and break bread with people. There are tons of examples where things are happening around meals, but what's really interesting is that Jesus kind of flips the script a little bit. You don't have to belong to the social elite. You don't have to just be a male. You don't have to be making decisions on political matters of that day and age. Instead, maybe he's telling you about political matters that are involved in the kingdom of God. And you would sit at the table and you would discuss what it means to follow God. That's what table fellowship looks like in the Bible. In fact, there are so many examples. I'm just gonna stick to the book of Luke. And even in the book of Luke, just to quickly run through, if you wanna go through and read some of these yourselves later, um, I felt like God was really wanting me to focus on Luke's gospel, specifically with table fellowship, and this is why. Jesus and Levi and synergy together in Luke 5. In Luke 7, Jesus is anointed by a sinful woman. In Luke 9, Jesus feeds the 5,000. In Luke 10, he sits in the home of Mary and Martha and explains what it means for us to sit at the feet of Jesus and learn and see who he is. In Luke 14, he has Sabbath at a Pharisee's house. In Luke 19, which is what we're gonna really spend most of our time on today, he has a meal with Zacchaeus. In Luke 22, it's the Last Supper. In Luke 24, he appears on the road to Emmaus. And in Luke 24, he also has a post-resurrection meal with his disciples. And those last three, they sound pretty bleak. They sound pretty bleak, but if you think about the tradition of symposium, two purposes. One, to learn. Two, to celebrate victories. And in those last three, whether it looks like it on this earth or not, they are celebrating the victory that is the sacrifice in Jesus but we're gonna focus on something else. We're gonna focus on what it means to sit around the table and learn how we become a bigger part of the kingdom of God, how we learn from one another, how we pour into one another, what it means to fellowship. So if you have your Bibles, you turn with me to Luke chapter 19, and we're gonna be talking about Zacchaeus, the tax collector. While you're flipping, I know you probably are all expecting me to sing that Sunday school song I would. I don't know it. I guess my Sunday school here. I should have looked it up, but I, I, I didn't look it up. I don't know. Excuse me. Luke chapter 19, we're going to be reading in verses 1 through 10. And here's what we're going to do. And this might be a little different than how I've done things in the past. I'm going to read it the whole way through. And then we're going to go back and kind of talk about it. So just bear with me for 10 verses as we read. Verse 1 says this. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was bare there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down and he welcomed him gladly. And all the people saw this, and they praised the Lord. No, what did they do? All the people saw this, and they muttered, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up, and he said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this home, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. The son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Let's go back. We're gonna look in beginning verse one. 
It says Jesus that entered the town of Jericho. Jericho's a pretty busy town. It's a pretty big thoroughfare. Lots of people come in and out every day. And Jesus is just kind of, it tells us in verse one, he's just passing through. He was just there. He was going from one place to another. He was passing through this town. And there, there was a man named Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. What's really interesting is about the way it describes Zacchaeus. It tells us was statements. States of being. He's not doing any action in the beginning. It tells us that he was a tax collector, that he was wealthy, that he was short. These are descriptive things that describe who this person is based on his physical or social or whatever appearance. This is who Zacchaeus was. Who he was. But it tells us that he wanted to know something. Zacchaeus wanted to know who Jesus was. What's this hype train about? Who is this Jesus guy? Who is he? So because he wanted to know who Jesus was, it tells us that he performs an action. He runs ahead and he climbs a tree. He runs ahead and he climbs a tree. Now, a couple things about who Zacchaeus was. He was a tax collector. I don't know if you know anything about tax collectors in the Bible, but people did not like tax collectors. Let's be honest, if the IRS calls you today, no offense if you work for the IRS, if the IRS calls you today, you're not gonna be really excited about it, are you? No, they're never calling to tell you happy birthday or to say, hey, you're doing a really good job at your job lately. No, you don't wanna hear from the IRS. And for the most part, those of you I know that are in this room and watching online, I know that you guys are good IRS employees, that you're not trying to steal anybody and you're just trying to do your job. We know that. These people were not. They were crooks. They were stealing money. They were taking a little bit more than they needed to. Why? Because they were patting their pockets and becoming what it says Zacchaeus was wealthy. It doesn't tell you that Zacchaeus was someone that was interested in the people around him. It doesn't tell us that Zacchaeus was someone who was concerned about his neighbor. It doesn't tell us that Zacchaeus was a prominent member of his community. It tells us that Zacchaeus was wealthy and that he was a tax collector. And not only was he a tax collector, he was the chief tax collector. So what does that tell you? All the people that are robbing everybody, now he's saying, now give me your cut. So now he's above all the people that are stealing from everyone else, and he's saying, let me have some of that too. He was the chief of the crooks. So let's be clear. Zacchaeus probably wasn't loved too much in his own culture. By the way, please don't audit me, IRS. I didn't mean any of it, and I know you guys are great people. <clears throat> But he does something. He runs ahead, he climbs a tree because he wants to see who Jesus was. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? And Jesus was coming that way, it tells us, and then it says Jesus reached the spot and immediately he doesn't walk by and he doesn't say, ugh, or gross. How dare you, Zacchaeus, you crook. He walks by and he says, Zacchaeus, come here, man. Come here, man. Let me talk to you for a minute. Actually, you know what? Let's go to your house. Let's go to your house. Let's break bread. Let's have a meal together. Don't know about you guys, but if I was in a tree trying to see Jesus, and I don't know who Jesus is, but I'm trying to figure it out, but there are rumors that he might be like, I don't know, the savior of the world, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Messiah coming to bring freedom to our oppressed people. I don't know that if he were like, hey, let's go eat at your house, I'd be like, I need 10 minutes. Give me 10 minutes, Jesus. I want you to come, but my kid, it's a mess. I didn't put my clothes away. There's laundry everywhere. He doesn't say that. What does he say? It says that when he came down, Zacchaeus, come down. Come down, Zacchaeus. He says, so he came down at once and he welcomed him gladly. He was so excited. What happens is Jesus walks by and he sees someone who the rest of the world despises. The rest of the world can't stand. And he looks at him and he says, hey man, come with me. 
He knows why Zacchaeus is in the tree. Zacchaeus is looking for something better. Zacchaeus is looking for community. Zacchaeus is looking for hope. And he's resting that principles and those foundations of what he's seeking in this person of Jesus. Which, by the way, if you're going to place it in anyone, please let it be in Jesus. And not me or not Pastor Jerry or not Emmanuel or Don or like... Are your parents or your kids, they are not your hope. They are not your salvation. He recognizes it so much so that he climbs a tree and seeks him out and says, oh, there he is. But what's really interesting is that Jesus knows him too. Jesus knows him too. When I was kind of preparing for this week, I kind of thought of Zacchaeus in like today's context. He would probably be one of like the um, like super big, I'm not gonna use any names because they're super famous and well-known and again, attorneys and I don't wanna deal with that. Um, but he, I kind of pictured Zacchaeus would have like maybe billboards, like injured, call Zacchaeus and I'll come take all your money. Like, <laughs> let's be fair, Jesus may know him from the world standards because he's this chief tax collector in this major city. True, fair, but Jesus knows him because he knows him. He knows him because he looks at him and he sees what he's seeking and he says, hey, you want, you want to have a relationship? You want to grow? Come with me. Let's go to your house. Let's hang out. So they do. They do. He walks them gladly. In verse seven, all the people stand around and go, oh, no. All the people look around and they mutter. Also, I love it. I don't know exactly the Greek translation for the word mutter, but it can't be good. But uh, mutter is this, can you believe he's going over to their house? How dare he? Eating at the house of a sinner? Ugh. They all watched Zacchaeus climb that tree. And also, by the way, it says all, all the people. The righteous, the self-righteous, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, the people that didn't know Jesus, all, maybe even the disciples, all, all the people saw this and then began to mutter, he's going to be a guest at the house of a sinner? How dare he? I thought about this. Uh, we did FCA at Fletcher this past week. <coughs> Sorry. We did FCA at Fletcher this past week, and it was super cool. It was a lot of fun, and the kids there are just amazing. And a lot of them were our students. A lot of them were new, and it was really, really fun. Great time. And one of the things I talked to them about was a, another story in here about Levi and these, and these sinners. And, and I thought about it, and I was like, how many times do you go by the lunch table and you see someone standing by themselves when all they want is community, all they want is hope, all they want is someone to sit down and share a meal with them, yet you walk by? Because I know I did. I walked by, and I sat with my friends. I didn't sit with that person by themselves. How hard is that, though, to share 20 minutes of your life with someone that you don't know? It's modeled here. Jesus, he doesn't know the guy necessarily by the worldly standards. He knows him because he knows him because he's Jesus, because he's the son of God. But come down. Let's go have a meal. What would it look like to walk by somebody and say, come, let's have a meal? What would it look like to go into somebody in Sago and look like they're having a terrible day and you just say, hey, can I sit with you? You might have to grab coffee together. It'd be weird probably because we're not used to being nice. We're not used to living lives focused on Jesus. We're used to living lives focused on ourselves. It says Zacchaeus stood up though because he hears, right? We know when people are talking about us. He stands up and said, look, Lord, look, Lord, here now, here now. I give half of all of my possessions, all of it, all my wealth. I give half of it right now. And if I've cheated anyone, if I've cheated anybody, I'll pay it back four times. Four times. You're not talking about someone who finds community. You're talking about someone who finds transformation. He is transformed in this moment. Why? Because someone cares about him. Because someone sees him. Because someone says, let's go to your house and have a meal. And he says, finally, someone that doesn't hate me. Someone that really cares. Someone that wants to know me. Someone that values my life. He's transformed by that. He's transformed by that. And Jesus tells him, today salvation has come to this house because you belong. You belong. 
You are a son of Abraham. And the reason why I'm here is not to have meals with these self-righteous people. The reason why I'm here is to come and to seek and to save the lost. Uh, we're going to also look back in Luke 5 really quickly. If you want to flip back, if you don't want to, that's okay. You don't have to. Luke 5, it should be on the screen. But Luke 5, 31 and 32, we have a similar thing that happens. It's really interesting. Some of the language that's exactly the same. But Jesus, uh, there's this guy named Levi. And he's just also a tax collector. What is it with these tax collectors? He's also a tax collector and he's sitting in his tax booth. And what's really cool about Levi is he looks at him and he says, hey, follow me. Just like he told Zacchaeus, come down from that tree and let's go to your house. He looks at Levi and he says, follow me, follow me. And it tells us that Levi just drops everything and walks away. God, I'll, take, I'll give you half of everything and then four times the amount. That's what Levi's walking away from because he has money. He has worldly possessions. It tells us that in his job title alone, he's a tax collector. But he's looking for something else or he wouldn't have left also. Jesus says, follow me, and he drops everything and he goes with him. And it's just like when he called his first disciples. They were fishing and he says, drop those things. And they dropped their nets and they went with him. Just like this, he follows them. But 31 and 32, again, What's really interesting is the Pharisees, it tells us specifically, it doesn't say all the people, it's really specific this time. It says, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belong to their sect complained to Jesus' disciples, not to Jesus. They looked at his disciples and they're like, what is this guy doing with you guys? He's making you go eat with sinners? What is happening over here? They don't even have the audacity and the guts to say it to Jesus himself. But Jesus must have had really, he's a good listener. Uh, Jesus had really good ears. He could hear what they were saying. They're talking over here and they must not be good whisperers either. And Jesus says to them, he goes, it's not the sick. Sorry, it's not the healthy. Sorry, it's not the healthy who need a doctor. But it's the sick. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. But sinners to repentance. In these moments, Jesus is very specific about the types of people that he's going after. The people that are seeking him, that are looking for hope, that are trying to find something new. They're not his best friends. These two stories, we're not talking about a meal with his disciples. We're talking about tax collectors, sinners, that he's going and sitting down, he's breaking bread with. He's bucking all the system. Remember the symposium thing? Again, they're sitting down with people in the same hierarchy, the same social class, the same status as them, and they're sharing a meal and breaking bread together. Why? Because it's easy. Because that's what culture says we have to do. Culture says that we stay in our lanes, that we stay in our neighborhoods, that we hang out with our friends, that we don't associate with certain people, that we only hang out with people that can do this, this, and this. We have these rules, these sort of unspoken things that we say. But Jesus shows us that's not the way that we reach people for him. That's not the way we point people to hope. So what do we do with all of this, right? Because Jesus models this. I mean, I'm guessing you're probably not expecting to walk home and see some dude hanging in a tree and be like, hey, come to my house, you crazy person. Uh, you're not expecting that. So how do we do it? What do we do? First of all, let's just be clear. You don't have to immediately go out and just have meals with all of these people that you don't know. It really starts, if I'm honest, in our own homes, with our own families. You know, in the blessed book, he kind of lays out this chart, which again is super convicting um, because our big MO is that we don't have time or it's hard to work around schedules. I'm busy. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and so is everyone else. Try booking a meeting at the same time as someone else. It's hard. But he lays out this sort of chart and he goes, okay, if there's seven days a week and there's three meals a day. That's 21 meals that you're going to eat. How many of those are you intentional with? How many of those are you actually spending time with people either that you know or that you don't know? How many times are you actually reaching people and saying, hey, we met at that thing. Can we go grab lunch or coffee or whatever? 21 opportunities per week. I wouldn't, again, do the math, but I'm not really good at math. So that's a lot of times throughout a year 
that we could sit down and have a meal. And he even says, you know what? Sometimes meals just don't work. We get that, right? Like, so maybe it's somebody that says, oh, I'll go to work at like 7 a.m. Great. Coffee shop's open at 6. Let's grab a cup of coffee before you go to work. Maybe it's, oh, I can't. I go in super early. I get off at like 5. Great. Uh, And I have to go home and have dinner with my family. Great. Great. Can you step out for 30 minutes after that? Maybe we'll go grab a drink together. Maybe we'll hang out in your yard. Maybe I'll come to you. Invite yourself over like Jesus did. <laughs> also, that cracks me up that Jesus is just like, let's go to your house. Jesus doesn't have a house. That's why he wants to go to everybody's house. <clears throat> so here are some practical steps that you can do. And also, by the way, in those 21 meals, I would just also ask if you have a kids and families and even just a spouse, like if it's just a spouse and you at home, how often of those 21, how many of those times do you eat with one another? Out, not even talking about outside of your family unit. I thought about this the other day. If, if bare minimum, if I sat down at every meal besides the one there at school, I'm still lose five every week with our kids being in school, right? But then you throw in practices and then you throw in uh, events and then you throw in other things and how many of those meals are we sitting down with our own families in fellowship? And if we can't start there, then we can't expand. It starts in the home and then it goes out. A couple things. Here's how it impacts your life. So when you have table fellowship, it impacts your life in this way. You go close or grow with the people that are close to you. You grow with the people that are close to you. So your friends... Your friends that you're hanging out with, that you know really well, all of that, right? When you sit down in a meal together, you grow closer to one another. When Jesus sits down with the disciples, it's probably a very different conversation than when Jesus sits down with Levi, right? Calling them into relationship. Or when Jesus sits down with Zacchaeus, calling them into relationship with him is a very different situation than you've walked with, you've lived with, you worked with these people for years a couple years, and you're walking with them, and then you sit down, and then Jesus is saying, now let's get to the good stuff. Because immediately you don't have to build any sort of relational equity. You can just grow together because you know each other. You love each other. Second thing it does, if you don't know, you get to know people that you aren't close to. So then you can reach out to people that you don't know. I will tell you, one of the things that we did, my wife and I had the uh, privilege of leading the Costa Rica mission trip in October, and we went with a great group. They were an amazing group. We didn't know that going into the trip. We didn't know, we knew some of them, but we didn't know everybody. And we didn't, the people that we did know, we didn't know them all that well. And you know what we did the night or the week before we left? We broke bread. We had a meal. We hung out. We didn't do any training. You know what we did every meal when we were there? We broke bread. We didn't all eat separately or when you can. No, we ate together. We helped clean together. We helped set out the meals together. We had teams and we sat down together and we had a meal. I was reminded of this because we do this in my family and I think it's something that um, I sometimes hate because I'm just in a bad mood. Um, but my wife makes us do this thing we call high-low buffalo where every, every day you have to walk around the table when we're sitting down at a meal and you have to tell everybody you're high, you have to tell everybody the low point of your day and you have to tell everybody something weird that happened to you that day. That's the buffalo. Um, and so what we did was when we went to Costa Rica, I would have never done this, but my wife was like, we're gonna do high low buffalo with the group. And I go, no, we're not. She goes, yeah, we are. And so we started every meal with, high, or at the end of the day, I think we do high low buffalo at dinner together. Why? You get to know people. You grow closer to one another. The third thing it helps you do is it helps you point people to Jesus. Above all, we are on mission. We are here for a reason. And as we aren't, uh, as we grow closer to one another, as we get to know people that we aren't close to, then we build relational equity and then we can point people to Jesus if they don't know him already. We can point people to Jesus. So action step for you is this. Look at your 21 meal calendar, find a time, and if it just doesn't work out this week, have coffee with someone. If you can't find a space on the meal, have a meal with someone. If you can't, Go to coffee, grab a drink after work. Do something where you're sitting down breaking bread, fellowshipping with somebody that either you really know well and you wanna grow closer to or somebody that you don't know all the well but you really would like to. 
Maybe even challenge yourself and say, I don't really know this person. I don't really want to know this person, but I'm going to have coffee with them anyway. Then you're living a life like Jesus. Um, and I want to tell you, I want to share with you a little bit about how this impacted my life. Because my life is, 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 is busier than I would like it to be sometimes. <coughs> and my wife, I've already told you, she makes me do things I don't want to do sometimes. But we have a special group of friends. Um, and you guys probably know them and you recognize them. If, I think we may have a photo. Um, if we do, that's great. If we don't, yeah, there's our friends. So uh, as you can see, we're very stoic people. Um, and uh, <laughs> these are the Sanchez's. Um, the Sanchez's go to church here and they are our close friends. And, and I cannot remember whose idea it was. It might've been Natalie um, and the one with the hat that you guys see hosting a lot. It might've been Natalie who, uh, who said, hey, we need, to, we need to spend time together. Our families need to spend time together. So we put it on the calendar. Every Tuesday is Taco Tuesday night. And because we're talking about eating, I wore my taco socks um, because that's what you do on Taco Tuesday. Um, but every Tuesday night, we have a meal together. And I will tell you, there are some Tuesdays I'm not interested in seeing anybody, much less a whole nother family. But these people, these people are a big part of our lives. Why? Because we prioritize breaking bread together. We prioritize relationship with one another. We prioritize growing with people that you already know. And let me tell you what happens when, this, when, the, when you do this. What happens when you do this is this. I walked in uh, a few weeks ago. It was a rough day, just a really rough day. A couple of really hard conversations, um, a couple of really long meetings, a couple of uh, <laughs> pressures from school that I had not met, things like that. It's tough. I'm exhausted. It's been a long day. Don't want to go eat tacos. Really don't. Not interested, but realized like, oh, I haven't seen my kids today. I probably should, should, should go see them. Um, and if I don't, go to taco night. They're going to be in bed by the time I get home. So let me go. And I walked in the door and immediately I walked in. And, and before I said anything, these two people that you just saw, they looked at me and they said, what's wrong? I said, nothing. I'm just tired. They go, no, no. What's wrong? Just, ah, just a long day. Just a rough day. Yeah. Okay. You want to talk about it? Nah, not really. Okay. Come here. And they put me in a Sanchez sandwich uh, <laughs> on taco night. How dare them? Um, they put me in a Sanchez sandwich and they prayed over me for strength and for perseverance and for patience and for joy. They prayed that for one hour, my brain could stop thinking about the thousand things that it was thinking about and could focus on each other. They prayed in that moment that we ate together, that we broke bread together, that we grew together. Why? Because it's important. And that whatever I'm thinking about that's stressing me out isn't that important that we can't sacrifice one hour for it. So let's take this hour and let's hang out. Immediately, weight lifted off my shoulder. Immediately, joy filled the conversations. Immediately, I felt so much better about that night. Taco nights are important. Put them on your calendar. And stick to them. Stick to them. Uh, this isn't the only example, or eating isn't only exemplified in the New Testament. There's also stories in the Old Testament of this. And one is really, really cool. Uh, it's the story of David and Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth is Jonathan's son. Um, Jonathan and Saul, if you don't know the story, David is an anointed king of Israel. Saul is still the king. Saul kind of loses the spirit of God. He goes a little wild. He's also suffering from some mental things, right? Um, but paranoia, and he's stressed about who's gonna replace him and when they're gonna replace him and all these things, right? So it leads to this like really weird relationship between Saul and David and like, a, it's, it's tough. Go back and read it. First and second Samuel, it's amazing. But long story short, Saul's son, Jonathan and David are really great friends. And Jonathan loves David and he's loyal and he's faithful and he actually saves David's life a couple times. It's amazing. But what happens is in this story, uh, Jonathan and Saul die. David becomes the king of Israel. And after he's the king of Israel, he, he asks, is anyone from Saul's family still alive? Now, this is a person that tried to kill him. This is a person that chases him. This is a person that doesn't, is anybody from Saul's family alive? And somebody tells him, yeah, there's this guy named Mephibosheth. He's Jonathan's son. He says, bring him to me. 
the guy falls down, he comes in the room and he falls down at David's feet and he says, Lord, forgive me. He did nothing wrong. The coolest thing about Mephibosheth is that he was also had lame feet, like he was disabled. He falls at David's feet and he says, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, whatever I did, I'm so sorry for, he goes, are you this person? He says, I am. He says, you always have a place at my table. You always have a place at my table. And it's such a beautiful story of what it means to represent this through eating. But I want you to know that you always have a place at God's table. Just like David tells Mephibosheth, we come in with our junk. I mean, not that he did anything to cause himself to have lame feet, but we come in with our stuff. We think we're not worthy. We think we're not good enough. We think we don't deserve it. God wants you to know, it's nothing about being worthy. It's nothing about deserving it. He wants you to come down from the tree. He wants you to realize that you have a seat at his table. So we're gonna do something, just a moment, every head bowed, every eyes closed. And this is you. If this is you, I want you to say this prayer with me. If you are um, lost, if you are seeking hope, if you're looking for something new, if you don't feel you are worthy, and in this moment you realize I do have a seat at God's table, I want you to do me a favor. I just want you to slip your hand up. I just want you to put your hand up if you know this. If you wanna enter into a relationship with Jesus in this moment, raise your hand please for just a moment and pray this prayer. God, I want to come to your table. I want a seat. I recognize that Jesus is the Lord and Savior of my life. And he is the source of hope. And I welcome him into my heart today. Help me to walk in step with your plan and your vision for my life. Amen. Amen. Thank you. For those of you that raised your hand, please fill out a Connect card. Uh, let everybody know that, that somebody can talk to you so we can speak with you, so we can have conversation with you. The altar is open. The altar is open. Please come and pray. Uh, please come and spend time with the Lord. Like the song we sang first, welcome home, man. The prodigal, God wants you to come home. He wants you to come home. He wants you to come home, have a meal. Let's pray. God, thank you for this day. Thank you for these moments. Thank you for uh, just how you are there for us, how you open your table for us, how you speak into our lives, how you allow us to be ourselves and how you love us despite ourselves. Thank you for Jesus and the example that he set. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for friends. Thank you for tables. Thank you for communities that we may grow together and learn who you are and who your character is based on the relationships with one another. We love you. We praise you. Amen.